Hi everybody, I'm Jim Porter and welcome to another edition of the Monotomy Journal. When we first started creating this episode, we did it with the intention of bringing you the story of the famous sculptor Cyrus Dallin. Here at the Dallin Museum at the Jefferson Cutter House in Arlington Center, you can see four teeming galleries of Dallin's amazing work, but we'll have more about that later. Dallin also created Arlington's own Monotomy Indian Hunter, which stands in the gorgeous Robbins Park between Robbins Library and Town Hall. Dallin's depictions of Native Americans are his largest and most important body of work. The Indian Hunter stands in tribute to the First Nation that once called our land their home. It's impossible to talk about the work of Cyrus Dallin without first reflecting on Arlington's own Native American history. Now, who were the first people who inhabited our land? What were they like? And what happened to them? The story of our First Nation is a story of a lost people. Records of their lives are scarce. Centuries of severe oppression forced their language, customs, and histories underground, and sadly into extinction. Arlington was once part of the domain of the great sachem of the Massachusetts Tribal Federation. His name was Nana Pashamit. Nana Pashamit's domain stretched from the Atlantic Ocean to the Connecticut River Valley, and from here in the Blue Hills all the way to the Merrimack River. At the time of Nana Pashamit's reign, the Massachusetts Tribal Federation was one of the most powerful and influential in all of New England. But just as Nana Pashamit attained his full glory as a leader, a series of tragic events began to unfold, events that would eventually erode his federation and devastate his people. As a result of disputes arising from the French fur trade, a vicious war erupted in present-day Maine. It was of such an enormous scale and ferocity that eventually Nana Pashamit was drawn into the fight. However, it was the worst possible timing for the Massachusetts. Because of first contact with Europeans, Nana Pashamit's people were stricken with a devastating disease for which they had no immunity. Their numbers were decimated, according to some reports, by as much as 90%. Weakened and unable to defend themselves, their enemies from Maine raided coastal villages, sending Nana Pashamit and his people fleeing inland. Eventually, Nana Pashamit was killed in battle. When his wife and children finally came out of hiding, they returned to a horrific scene. Entire villages completely empty. It was a devastating sight. Since Nana Pashamit's sons were too young to rule, it was customary for his wife to take over his former domain. Today we don't know her name. It was considered respectful among the First Nation to avoid speaking the name of their leaders. As a result, we only know her by her native title. It's derived from the Eastern Algonquin language, and it means female chief. We know her only as Squaw Sachem. Squaw Sachem ruled during a tumultuous time. She was at war with former members of her husband's domain, those who had formed new alliances after her husband's death. Her enemies from Maine continued their assault from the north. She had increasing pressure from the growing Narragansett Federation from the south. She still feared her people's mortal enemy to the west, the Mohawk, and she was threatened by the growing settlements of the powerful English to the east. The First Nation of the Mystic Valley was on the brink of total annihilation. But Squaw Sachem had the strength and the wisdom to do the only thing that would keep her people alive. It was a bold and risky move, but she knew it had to be done. She manufactured an alliance with the English. It was through that alliance that the English settled the town of Charlestown. And if you thought things couldn't get much worse for Squaw Sachem and her people, you'd be wrong. Shortly after allowing the settlement at Charlestown, about 1633, they were hit again with another deadly plague that killed untold numbers. The disease would claim the life of two of Squaw Sachem's sons. And at about the same time, the fur trade was collapsing and wampum was quickly losing value. There was just one thing left that the First Nation owned that was of any value to the English. Their land. Squaw Sachem sold every last bit of her land except for a small parcel here on the western side of the Mystic Lakes. She passed away on this land in 1650.
Her remaining people were rounded up and sent to praying Indian villages where they were to undergo religious conversion and learn how to live as Europeans. But when King Philip's war broke out, the remaining Massachusetts were either sold into slavery or interned on Deer Island in Boston Harbor. The internment here was one of the most deplorable chapters in American history. More than 60% died from starvation, exposure, or disease. They were treated this way despite the fact that they continued to help the English in the war. Descendants of the Massachusetts do survive today. It's only the Massachusetts language and traditions that have been lost. Many native persons today have a great deal of trouble tracing back their genealogies because the records have been wiped from the face of the earth. We urge all Arlingtonians to visit Habermach's home site at Plymouth Plantation and talk with the native people who work there. Learn their story. Also attend the yearly celebrations and powwows, which are generally free and open to the public especially the annual Harvest Moon celebration of the praying Indians of Natick and Ponkapog. Reach out to these native communities and help acknowledge their vital role in our history. We're here because of their ancestors. And in that way, let us begin the healing.
Cyrus Dallin was born in Springville, Utah, which is about 80 miles south of Salt Lake City, on November the 22nd in 1861. He had grown up in Utah during the 19th century. He was born in Springville, Utah in 1861 and lived there till he was approximately 20 years old. And at that time he came to Boston to study, to be an artist, a sculptor. His early years in uh, Utah were um, filled with his, um, he was very attached to the mother and uh, she did have an art background on her own and she was teaching him art and she found that uh, he was very favorable. So then eventually as he got a little into the teenage years he was able to work in his uh, father's uh, silver mine and um, when he went down there of course the Native Americans from the uh, Watash tribes down there they, uh, they were assisting his father in taking the red clay out of the, uh, the mine and uh, so Dallin take, took that red clay and while they were having a break of a smoke break or a lunch or whatever he uh, ended up uh, creating them and sculpture and they held him in great, great esteem. His experience living among the Native Americans gave him a deep and abiding respect for their culture and a sympathy to their plight whose lands and herds and way of life was quickly dissolving. When you see his Native American sculptures, you can see that great sense of regality, that great sense of uh, humanness that he gave to the Native American sculptures. Probably the most, one of the most moving pieces of art in Boston that almost everybody knows, whoever goes to the Museum of Fine Arts knows that wonderful statue, yeah. Appeal to the Great Spirit, yeah. and, and, and I'm sure everybody like me doesn't know who did it. Yeah. Uh, it was the first one that I noted years and years ago when I was in college because I saw it at the Museum of Fine Arts on a tour over there. At the time I didn't realize it was done by Cyrus Dallin, of course, and that's generally the situation with most people. They recognize the the statue of, of, the, of the Sioux chief who was praying to his God, but they don't know that it was done by Dallin. This is um, a, representing a Sioux chief who was defeated by the U.S. Army and he's engaged in prayer to the great spirit Wakantanka for mercy or peace. It's still nonetheless probably one of the most moving pieces of art you know, it has moved more people, let's put it that way, than, than, than many pieces of art. It's an impressive, impressive piece of work uh, and typifies, I think, the kind of feelings that Dallin had for Native Americans, much more so than uh, other artists, I think. I have come to realize that he was very acutely aware of, of their state when he was working on them. And I think he was trying perhaps to go back in time and show them as they were. He had a great affection for them because he saw them as they really were. Uh, whereas uh, somebody like Charlie Russell or Frederick Remington would show the Native Americans in a more warlike, more vicious atmosphere, Dallin saw them in a more family orientated, uh, you know, more peaceful, uh, attached to the earth. And also to separate out the stereotyped gestures you know, the grand gesture of Washington, the this, the that, from this guy in front of the MFA who's going like this. He's going, God help me. It's a totally different feeling. As a sculptor, I think two things that I like best about him that I believe he was a master at were uh, gesture 
and facial expression. The power of each one of those sculptures that we're talking about is, is the gesture. The gesture is so important to, to and it's so, it's so obvious, and we see gesture all day long that we don't realize how important it is as a method of communication and how much Dallin is putting and puts across in that, in that incredible gesture. Just, and everybody who sees it gets it. There's one called The Medicine Man, which I uh, was, it's a private owner, brought it to me, and it was uh, missing an arm. And uh, I talked to the guy for a long time. You know, we talked about it, and it was expensive, but I said, you know something, this arm is very important to the piece. And so finally he consented, and I was, I was able to, 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 to take on the work of reconstructing the arm. Uh, for which was interesting. It was technically difficult. The, the Dallin Museum was actually very helpful to me because they loaned me a smaller version of it, uh, a bronze, which is in the museum. It's only about this big. But they loaned it to me for a weekend so that I could look at the musculature of the arm and, and make sure that I had the gesture right. And, and the gesture is so important to this piece because it's, he's, you can see from his face, if you, again, if you allow it to develop, that his, his, there's a, a kind of anguish in his face and a far-seeingness in his eyes. He's seeing an awfully lot and he's reacting to it. Or he's, you can tell he feels deeply about it and his gesture expresses his response. And his response is, it's not like this, like it's not passive and it's not active. It's like this, it's like saying, wait, wait, please wait. It's such a beautiful arm. Dallin appears to have been moved by the particular subject in, in the ways that we've been talking about. And because of that, he chose the whole gesture has meaning for him. Because that's, he really sees that person that, in that particular struggle, and he wants to show that. Uh, and because that's why the gesture, I believe, is so powerful. And why he needs to show the whole figure, because he's really aware of, of who they are and what they're doing. The gesture is the highest form of communication, meaning even more than speech or poetry or music, the gesture has more content than, than anything else. Right. And it's very interesting because Dallin was a master of gesture. He, so that's, but also he was a, a, a portrait artist par excellence. And these three little girls, uh, as I worked on them, basically what I needed to do was to clean the faces so that we could see the very fine lines at the corners of the mouth and the, the, at the edge of the eyes, which is where character ultimately is, is expressed in a portrait. Yes. And um, so it was, you know, it was a good idea, and it often is. That's much of the work that I've done for the Dallin Museum, is taking off layers of paint that thick coat fine details and bringing it back to the original, which then, uh, uh, you, you, like I said, is often a color wash. In this case, I didn't. In this case, I coated it again with, with a thin paint and bronze highlights to make it look bronze. During the process of working on it, I, I got to know each of those three girls quite well. And it was, I can't explain how it is. It just sort of develops almost like a, a photograph. It develops over a period of weeks. You, I start to think I know them. And, um, and, and I, I developed very clear opinions about all three of the girls. There was one who was very uh, studious and um, um, obviously knew the right answer to the question that you asked her and very prim. And then there was an older one who was probably kind of shy and she, um, she was the older sister, you know, she was responsible for the other ones and she didn't look, you know, she wasn't going to take the, the front seat ever. She was always going to be the one who kind of knew how to take care of these kids. And then the, the youngest, I, again, I'm only assuming the youngest one was um, bright as a button and clearly very pretty and, and obviously got what she wanted wherever she went. <laughs> I, I'm still kind of mystified as to what Dallin felt about this woman because um, it's very clear in the sculpture that she looks kind of like a battle axe. And um, uh, I thought perhaps, I mean, I got the piece from the museum painted Battleship Gray. And I thought, well, here, here's my chance. You know, I get, to, I get a chance to lighten this up a little bit. <laughs> I, 
So um, we, we stripped off the paint. It was very you know, time consuming to take it all off and get the sharp details of the face back. And then I said, now I get to warm her up a little bit with these you know, burnt umbers and, and, and burnt siennas and sort of just bring some warmth back to it. And then I was working on her and I was looking at her face and she has a, it's not exactly a frown, but it's a, it's a very determined look. And, and, and you know something, I think that's really what he wanted to say about her, frankly, is that she was an incredibly determined woman. She uh, invented Mother's Day and um, it wasn't a sentimental thing for her. I think it was like these women need respect and they need consciousness. And uh, so I think that's really what he wanted to say about her, but I still couldn't help myself. And when I was putting on the, um, the burnt umber, you know, t you know, just bringing out little details, not too much of the wrinkles, but you know, some of the character lines around the eyes and the pupils and things like that, I couldn't help seeing if I could add a little smudge at the top of each corner of the mouth, <laughs> see if I could give her a little bit of a smile. <laughs> and it didn't work. Um, I think you could say that, that, that Dallin uh, is probably the iconic sculptor for Boston. He did Plymouth Rock. He did this wonderful one at the MFA. And he did the sculpture of Paul Revere. I mean, taken together, that kind of says something a lot about Boston. I, probably not the only person who, who, whose basic images of what Mormonism is as a religion is formed by a gold angel on top of almost all of their temples. And that gold angel is so beautiful that that's like a, a clarion call. It's a note that I hear whenever I think about Mormonism. And it's a Dallin sculpture and, and nobody knows it. But he always maintained his ability to portray, either through sculpturing or some paintings, this, this ability to tell the world how it really was like to be a Native American or a Minuteman or um, a First World War soldier or, or, or one of his kids. I'm afraid this is, again, I, I have to say this about the world we live in now. We seldom give art a chance to, to, to develop in our minds. And, and, and I'm the same way, and, and honestly, I, I will walk past a sculpture for most of my life and never stop and look at it and allow it to be what some guy or some woman spent months, maybe even years, creating this thing so that this is what they, this is what they mean. And, and the way it's there in the sculpture isn't at all obvious. It's, it's there, but you have to let it develop in you somehow and, and, and give it a chance in a way that I can't even describe, but I, I know that, you know, I'm lucky in the sense that I had to work on these. You know, I had a lot of work to do, so I was always looking at them and I, you know, I began to let them in. And Dallin was so good a sculptor that it's a shame that, that we, don't, we don't let him in anymore because some of his pieces, um, I think, are, are just, are, are really real art. Really, their comments and big statements about about the world as he saw it.